Hey, GrowWire listeners, thanks for tuning in. I'm your host, Fritz Nelson, and I'm joined by Kendall Fisher, producer and host of the GrowWire show. And Kendall is a little bit under the weather today. I am, but I kind of like my voice when it's like a little raspy. A little scratchy. Yeah. Okay. Well, I hope that you feel better. Thank Um, you. But I hope somehow you can like get this voice back from time to time. I know, right? I hope our listeners like it. Hmm. Right in. Tell us. (laughs) Okay, on this episode, we are joined by Lauren Woodman. She is the CEO of NetHope. And NetHope unites a consortium of nearly 60 leading global nonprofits with technology companies and funding partners. The idea here is to design, fund, implement, adapt, and scale innovative approaches to solve development, humanitarian, and conservation challenges. And we're going to hear some real life stories about how NetHope has helped nonprofits change the world through the power of technology. She also dives into some of the biggest challenges she's seen organizations face. Stay tuned for all of this and more. You're listening to the Grow Wire podcast, a place where you will learn the ins and outs of growing a business, running a business, or even taking your big idea, career, or personal development to the next level. It's all possible. Our host, Fritz Nelson, the editor-in-chief of GrowWire.com, will take you on an exploration of growth through candid conversations with some of the most brilliant minds in entrepreneurship, entertainment, business development, and more. Whatever your goal, we know you'll walk away with the right tools to help fuel your journey of growth. Before we get into this podcast with Lauren Woodman from NetHope, here's a word from our sponsors over at Hint. If you don't know about Hint yet, the brand is all about making the everyday more enjoyable. It started when Kara Golden, Hint's founder, needed a way to drink more water but wanted flavor without the sugar and sweeteners that come in most drinks. So she created Hint Water. It has just a hint of flavor from real fruit essences without any of those added sugars or sweeteners. Everyone at the Grow Wire office is a big fan of Hint Waters. I especially like the echinacea version. I I almost stopped you, but I love that you said echinacea. That is my number one go-to thing when I'm sick, and I haven't had it, and I think that's why I got sick. Well, you should have been drinking the echinacea hint waters. Okay, there's no echinacea hint waters. However, my favorite flavor of hint that kind of is like healing, I guess, is they have a ginger flavor. It's fizz. It's one of the fizz um, sparkling ones. So Ooh. that would be very oh, good I'll have right to now. try that one. That yes, sounds good. Definitely. I'm kind of thirsty, too. <laughs> well, you can try them out for yourself. Maybe not the echinacea one. Maybe they'll develop it for people who feel a little cold coming on. <laughs> you can go to hint.co slash welcome to get 30% off your first purchase. We also want to make sure you head over to growwire.com. That's G-R-O-W-W-I-R-E dot com for more articles that focus on nonprofit insights, tools, and stories of growth. For example, we have an article that dissects the impact that hackathons can have for social good. And we have another article that breaks down the five secrets to building trust with a nonprofit board. Very important. That's all ready for you right now on growwire.com. Just go there and search nonprofit. Lauren, can you give our listeners a, an overview of who NetHope is? Sure, and, and thanks for the opportunity to be here and, and talk about NetHope. NetHope is a consortium of 57 of the world's largest humanitarian development and conservation organizations, and we work in partnership with the technology sector to figure out how we use technology to solve the world's hardest problems. If you had to say it in a mission statement, is what what would your mission statement be? Yeah, we, we think of our mission statement as, you know, is what are we trying to accomplish? And and what we try to accomplish is empowering organizations to use technology effectively in pursuit of whatever their respective missions are. We have organizations that are focused on child sponsorship or refugee support or conservation or any variety of things. Our belief in what holds us together 
is that technology can play a meaningful role in advancing that mission. Gotcha. Okay. Can we go back and just talk about the origins of NetHope? How did it get started? When? By whom? Sure. So NetHope's been around almost 20 years. Um, so uh, in 2021, we will we will celebrate our 20th anniversary, and we're 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 quickly counting down to that. Um, it's hard to believe that we've been around that long. Time flies. Um, it does. And uh, but we came together when a number of organizations, seven international nonprofits, and Cisco came together because those organizations were really challenged with getting connectivity in the far-flung places in which they worked. And they recognized that they needed connectivity in order to do their work effectively. Many of them had approached Cisco. Cisco was working with some. And through a series of conversations and and ultimately some pretty brilliant insights from a, a Cisco exec and Ed Happ, who at the time was with Save the Children, wrote a white paper called Wiring the Digital Village. And out of that was born NetHope. And so ever since then we started with this idea that if we worked together we could do more together than we could separately and in working in partnership with the technology sector we could extend the resources that were made available to the nonprofit sector to do even more good than if we all tried to go at it alone 20 years ago was it hard to get not nonprofits to care about the idea of social impact well i think you know for many of the the corporate partners that that were early adopters in in working with NetHope, you know, frankly, that that idea of social impact was really baked into what they did. I mean, Microsoft was one of the the first companies that that came in after that, and Intel and and a number of others over the years. But you know, I think a lot of those large technology companies, just like we see today, you know, social impact is really part of what they're thinking about. I mean, certainly they have a commercial bent, and that's where they they start from. But, you know, I think there's always been a little bit of idealism in the technology sector, um, and that's carried through to sort of thinking about how can we do more with the products and services we create. What was unique about Cisco and being the first that you worked with there? Well, I think that, I think one, it was a question of opportunity, and two, I think it was, you know, I think it was sort of forward-looking leadership coming out of Cisco in terms of saying, yes, this is a place where we can add some value, and we understand the importance that connectivity will have on the work that these organizations are doing. You know, Cisco had certainly seen that with their with their commercial customers and it wasn't hard to make that leap to see what the benefit might be from a from a nonprofit perspective. Jumping into the technology part of it. So, you know, what are the typical things that nonprofits were struggling with in that regard? You mentioned them a little bit, but then or now? Then, yeah. Um, then I think it was probably a little bit of everything. Um, you know, if you think back twenty years ago, I think all of us, right, were struggling with how do we bring technology into the enterprise. You know, NetHope's members are all large global nonprofits. You know, they work in in dozens and dozens of countries, most of which are poorly resourced, many of which are very tough environments, some of which are in the middle of conflict or crisis. Um, you know, so, so these are organizations that in addition to trying to figure out how to get the right you know, sort of core enterprise infrastructure in place are also dealing with the external challenges that, that they were facing. 20 years ago, we were still dealing with the basic problems of connectivity and finance and HR and all of those sort of basic systems that that we were trying to knit together into a single enterprise approach. You know, n- now I think the the challenges that we face are, you know, obviously quite different. But a lot of the complexities that we were dealing with back then are, you know, some of the same complexities that we're dealing with now. These organizations still work in a lot of different places, in very resource-poor environments, in very difficult conditions, dealing with vulnerable populations and really hard problems. Um, And they're often doing that in times of crisis or conflict. You mentioned that your members are all pretty much global organizations. I mean, is that a prerequisite? It is. Okay. It is. Are there any other prerequisites? We focus on humanitarian development conservation organizations. So those are the three areas where we are specifically focused. There's real commonality um, in the way those organizations evolve and work. And so there's a there's a natural kinship amongst them. Our organizations are all quite large. You know, most are more than 100 million, 250 million, a billion dollars a year in, in, in annual expenditures. Um, and all of them work in, a, in at least, you know, two or three different continents and, and in, in all of the major developing regions of the world. They're all the organizations that, you know, Save the Children, Mercy Corps, Oxfam, Red Cross. You know, these are, these are big global brands that have a, a big footprint 
collectively, they're about 60% of the world's international aid. So it's a, it's a big it's a big group of organizations. One of the ones you didn't mention was Doctors Without Borders, and I think of them first when I think about them being in areas of conflict. Yes. Right? This is where they go yes. to do their work. Sometimes bombs are flying overhead, as we've probably all read or heard the stories of the challenges they've faced. I can't imagine the infrastructure issues they must face. If they're getting communications, it must be knocked out. So what would, any good <laughs> stories you can tell us about yeah, that? I mean, you know, in Doctors Without Borders is, uh, I would try and say the, the proper name in French, but um, I would offend French-speaking people <laughs> all over the world, so I, I won't do that. Um, you know, they're one of our members, and listening to some of the challenges that they face, you know, they, they work in, in, in truly unreal situations. And, and unfortunately, it, it is all too common that we hear about the loss of a staff member, you know, from not only from Doctors Without Borders, but from many of these organizations, because they are in individuals that put their lives on the line to go help other people. And and these days, you know, they're doing that with backpacks, you know, that, that provide them connectivity so that they can do very complex medical procedures with support from, you know, from experts and specialists in a safer place further away. Those organizations have been forced to be very innovative um, and very creative in the way that they use technology and what they take with them when they go into these situations. You know, but at the end of the day, all, all of the folks that work for these organizations are at their core humanitarians. And so they are willing to figure out um, whatever it takes and be as creative as is, as is necessary and use whatever tools are available in order to do the work that they feel compelled to do. We interrupt this podcast episode for a word from our sponsors over at Blue Mics. Everyone has a story to tell, and if you're a storyteller, you probably know Blue Mics for their iconic Yeti microphone, which has helped millions of people find and amplify their voices. If you're thinking about creating your own podcast, recording some voiceovers, gaming, or whatever you want to do, then you need to check out Blue's new Yeti Caster, the complete mic and boom arm system ready to connect to your laptop, bringing the ultimate broadcast studio setup to your home or office. That's what we use here at the GrowWire office. We really love them. We love how it accentuates Kendall's scratchy voice. We do, and we got little um, mic covers that are new, um, pop filters for those of you that are that know what I'm talking about. They go on the, the mic and they're very colorful. I'm very into them. They have orange, which I don't like because I'm I'm – that's the San Francisco Giants oh, right. colors, and there's one that looks like Dodger blues. So, right, right. Yeah. As we figured out in the previous episode, you love baseball and you love the Dodgers. That's right. Go check it out. It's with Jim Brower. He's a former MLB pitching. Well, he's a former MLB pitcher and now a pitching coach. That's right. Check it out. You'll also hear his prediction for the World Series. Right. Uh, so, to get your hands on one of these setups, visit bluedesigns.com and use the code PODCAST at checkout for a special price. So, wind the clock forward 20 years. What are the, How are the challenges technologically? How are they different? I mean, I always think about the ubiquity of, of mobile communications, but... That is absolutely not the case in a lot of third world countries. Even in second world countries, you know, in sort of mid-tier countries, you, you never think about the, the loss of connectivity until you don't have it. You know, I've been, I've been working in the technology sector and in, and in this particular space for, for many, many years. And, you know, I certainly have been through the ins and outs of, of not having connectivity. And it happens every single solitary time. You look down and it says no service on your phone. And there's this momentary panic of, of you know, how quickly will I get it back? Um, because we are so dependent upon it. And know the utility that, that those types of services bring to the, to the work that each of us do and certainly to organizations do. You know, looking at the, the challenges that we face today, you know, I wish I could tell you that they were fundamentally different, but they're not. Um, you know, all of these organizations, I think, you know, have, have mostly figured out there's always improvements to be made because nonprofits in general are sort of under-resourced. But, you know, they figured out HR and finance and, and, and those types of things are the, the core infrastructure that's necessary. But connectivity remains a challenge. You know, the Ebola crisis was just a couple of years ago, and one of the biggest challenges that we had in fighting Ebola was the fact that there was very little connectivity in, in any of the countries that were affected. And that, you know, had the potential to really disrupt where resources went um, in order to solve where the big problems were. You know, they, we looked at, once we started sort of laying out the data on a map, 
and looked at where infection weights were rising and where Ebola treatment units were being built and where there was connectivity. There was an inverse relationship between where Ebola treatment units were being built and where there was connectivity. And that makes total sense when you think about it. If you can't let anybody know that you have sick people, nobody's going to come and build you an Ebola treatment unit. And so, you know, it, people say, well, uh, you know, I hear people tell me all the time, well, do, do nonprofits really need these kind of tools? And you say, yeah, absolutely. These are exactly the kind of tools that nonprofits need. You know, these are exactly the kind of tools that we need in order to make sure that the precious resources that we have are, in fact, being spent where the greatest needs are. So we still struggle with connectivity, but we're also, you know, really focused on how do we make the best use of the data that we collect? How do we apply things like artificial intelligence and machine learning to the vast amount of data that nonprofits have so that we can figure out what really does work and, and in what kind of scenarios and, and under what kind of conditions are what types of interventions are, are most promising? You know, there's a tremendous amount of benefit that comes in 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 heading off problems, you know, and in, in, in trying to, to, to be preventative. And so, you know, all of the, the, the possibilities that arise because of the work of sensors and of drones of monitoring and figuring out what's happening and allowing us to say, let's get ahead of this, um, you know, before it happens. And certainly when you start to combine those types of things, you, you know, you, you, all of a sudden you can really get to some interesting insights that would allow us to be much more proactive. I was just having a conversation with someone earlier, you know, one of the things that we always try and get ahead of are things like cholera outbreaks. Cholera can spread very quickly. It can be very deadly. Um, and certainly anytime that you have flooding, you know, you worry about cholera. And one of the things that is tied to monitoring cholera is whether or not bridges have been washed out. You know, if bridges have been washed out, then that means that that flooding is is happening. People are stuck in one place. There is a, a the 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 chance for a rapid disease spread. And so, if you can monitor what happens with bridges and roads, it's not the only thing we should be watching, but it's certainly one thing that gives us an indication that boy, in thinking about where should we be thinking about being prepared to deploy, should we need to respond to an outbreak, that's one of the things that we watch for. But without data and without tools to monitor those types of things we're always in catch-up mode it's always reactive we're always reactive so how does it work like so we talked a little bit about the mission and and the role of net hope but like so do you bring the technology companies they're also members together with these organizations is that our members are actually just the nonprofits um, and we're supported by the by our corporate partners okay. um, so it, it's a it's a fine point but you know it, it's an important distinction in the sense that um, our corporate partners you know have, are, are organizations that have raised their hands and said you know look we we want to help um, and I think the thing that is different in a lot of the engagement that you see happening inside the net hope community versus you know, sort of just sort of run of the mill social impact kind of stuff is the NetHope membership is very collaborative. There's a high level of expectations around, you know, folks being collaborative and sharing experiences and learning from one another. There's not a lot of competition inside the NetHope tent per se. And and that expectation also sits with our with our corporate partners. And it is remarkable to see our corporate partners, some of whom are fierce competitors, you know, in the in the commercial market, really come together and you know, roll up their sleeves with a with a handful of nonprofits to think through how we might address a particular challenge. You know, how we might solve a, a problem that's you know either immediate or longer term. You know, how they can pool resources to to help a group of nonprofits address a particular issue. How we can solve some of the tactical challenges just around running technology at a global level for for these kinds of organizations. So there is a it, it is really a unique organization in in the fact that it is truly collaborative it it really is a bunch of folks trying to figure out how to do the right thing can you give you know maybe an example or two of some scenarios where this came together it's okay yeah. to name names. <laughs> no, so, um, and, and I will tell you, I come out of the technology sector. And so when I was first at NetHope, my, my, one of my first chapter meetings, a bunch of our European members were getting together and someone said, look, you're, you're, you're going to be amazed. You know, people really do collaborate. And I remember thinking, well, sure, I've, you know, in my commercial background, I have collaborated, quote unquote, with others, which means I do a PowerPoint, you do a PowerPoint, then we have drinks and we go home. You know, we, we don't ever actually do anything, but we do share information. And 
you know, I might share slightly more with you than I shared with someone else, but it's not, you know, it's not really collaboration. And I have to tell you, my jaw was on the floor when I watched, you know, organizations literally roll out, um, you know, a map of their network architecture and say, look, my stuff isn't working here and here and here. What do you do? And I'm sitting there thinking, man, in the commercial world, no one would have ever exposed their IT infrastructure at that level of detail to someone who, you know, it, Nonprofits compete for donor dollars, just like you know, private sector companies compete for for customers. It's a slightly different, but it's the same idea. And so, there, you know, there is a real sense of 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 openness. I think one of the places that you see companies, you know, really come together in times of crisis um, is especially around emergency response. Right now, for example, we're we are on the ground in the Bahamas, responding to um, the devastation that Hurricane Dorian brought there. And in those times of areas, NetHope members come together and share data and connectivity and all sorts of things. And NetHope serves as a, as a provider of those types of services across all of the responding organizations. There's no pride associated with, you know, which one of our corporate partners stepped up first or how much or what they're bringing to the table. It's all of a, here's what we have. Here's the demand that we have. How are we going to solve it? You know, we saw it in Puerto Rico. We had Microsoft there with um, with some of their TV white spaces technologies that, you know, meta connectivity need in certain scenarios. We had Cisco there with their equipment and with Ericsson response, um, all of everybody working side by side saying, this isn't a question of pride. Your solution works best in these kinds of geographies or in this kind of scenario or this kind of range. What, what are we gonna put where? Because it turns out Puerto Rico needs assistance, N- not, not our commercial markets right now. Right, right. You mentioned AI and, and kind of preventative, using data for maybe more preventative purposes. Are there any other interesting examples that you're seeing with AI in terms of what your partners are working with some of the members on? Yeah, I mean, there's there's certainly, you know, there's a tremendous amount of interest around what are the relationships and the interconnections between different types of interventions in terms of outcomes and impact. You know, if if I have uh, children in an under-resourced community and I'm providing food and education, you know, it's logical that if I provide food and education and vaccines, they're going to do better. But what if I provide food and education and vaccines and preventative health care for mom and dad and uh, more reliable power. Does that make a difference? The assumption is yes, but we know that not everything is as linear as, as, it, as we expect it to be. So really trying to dig into what are the types of interventions that make a meaningful impact is really an area of, of interest where you see you know, people coming together. I, I think that again, there, there's, I don't think that we can underestimate the importance of preventative you know, interventions. I mean, you think back a couple of years when we had the migration crisis in Europe, um, you know, and, and so many, so many folks coming over and, you know, everybody heading all across Europe, trying to predict where people were going to go, what that population looked like, how many diapers did we need in, in one place versus another place? And how many charging stations did we need? And, you know, what kind of medical care did we need? Being able to track those things is not only is is important not only in order to to ensure that we have the right resources in place but also then to be able to follow up appropriately and figure out sort of what the longer term impacts are of those interventions how do you how are those things tracked i remember being in turkey when the syrian crisis was happening and it was the streets were just flooded with these poor families just you know needing some help and and but it was it wasn't a surprise because as we were going to turkey we heard that we would see this, Mm -hmm. right? So we had to have known, how are these things tracked? Every organization does it slightly differently, and it really depends whether or not a displaced family is coming in as an economic migrant, are they coming in as a political refugee, are they coming in as a refugee from conflict, are they taken into the UN system, are they taken into a national system? It really varies pretty dramatically. And it's actually one of the huge problems that we have in in working with displaced populations, whether you're internally displaced, whether you're uh, forced to flee your country as a whole, where you end up. It's very difficult to track families and individuals that, that are on the move and be able to ensure, you know, the families that have already been ripped from their homes, they may not have their paperwork, they may not have their records, and, you know, they, they might be in one migrant camp or a refugee camp for a while, and maybe their kids went to a little bit of schooling there, but when they get to the next place, how do they prove that their kids have already, you know, at what level of education attainment? 
And so one of the big, big questions that, that we've really been struggling with amongst the organizations that deal with refugees over the past several years is, you know, is there a way to provide some reliable identification? you know, that, that refugees could then have so that they could sort of track these things over time. We're not quite there yet. I mean, as everybody knows, these questions of identity um, are not easy ones for anyone to solve with vulnerable populations that understandably have a real sensitivity to perhaps sharing their identity with authorities. Uh, you know, it gets, it gets even more difficult. So, you know, I don't know that there is a single way that we track everybody reliably yet, but it is one of those really big, gnarly questions that we are everyone in the sector is is trying to crack. How do you guys work with some of the more governmental organizations like USAID? Mm, we work with USAID quite a bit. You know, I think it, if there's one thing that's true in international development, everybody works together. There's not a lot of super clear swim lanes, you know, when it comes to, to solving problems. There are certainly things that some organizations are better at than others. There are different roles that we all play. Some are funders, some are, are implementers. Um, some bridge the gap between the two and, and work with a lot of partners. But, you know, we work with USAID quite quickly. We've, we have been working with USAID for many years now on a cooperative agreement that's been focused on building connectivity. And that has ranged in all, a whole variety of activities, you know, whether it's been building the case for governments to to build out more infrastructure or to support um, changes in the marketplace to allow more infrastructure to be developed or to working with regulators to help them understand you know what a what a good competitive marketplace might look like and what changes might need to be made or might or could be made to even actually doing um, the building of infrastructure or creating market mechanisms to allow infrastructure to come in and, and be built so you know, I think funders, the institutional donors like USAID and Diffid in the UK and AusAid and to the extent that they're still active and, you know, a lot of these sort of big government driven organizations play a critical role because they have a lot of resources to spare. They really do have a tremendous amount of of power in terms of funding innovation and, and creating new opportunities um, to leverage technology. You know, much like the nonprofit sector, we we tend to be risk averse. Our pre resources are pretty precious, so we tend to to move uh, more deliberately, perhaps, than the private sector does. And a, a lot of the institutional donors do as well, because they are dealing with tax dollars, um, and so they want to they want to be good shepherds of their their citizens' tax dollars as well. So, you know, I think there's there's some natural breaks in the system which are uh, appropriate and right to be there. And when we bring them together, though, with some good ideas and the expertise from all of the different sectors, sometimes we can get some really interesting things done. Which American company started with a guy in a garage, was featured on Shark Tank, and now has over 1 million customers? Hint, they're reducing crime in neighborhoods everywhere. Here's Ring Video Doorbell founder Jamie Siminoff with his secret to success. It's true. In just a few years, we've had huge growth. We've hired hundreds of people, expanded our warehouse, and we're shipping millions of units a year, all while making sure our customers are happy. I've had lots of things to worry about, but I never worry about our finance and accounting because we use NetSuite from Oracle. From the beginning, NetSuite let me see what's going on with my business in real time, from revenues to expenses, customers and orders, even HR. I run my business from a dashboard right on my phone. NetSuite has been my business management system from 10 to a team of over 1,000, and NetSuite will be my choice as we continue to innovate and grow. Go to netsuite.com slash ring to see how Jamie scaled his business. You'll also get our free guide titled Overcoming Your Five Obstacles to Growth. That's netsuite.com slash ring for your free guide and the story of a great American company. netsuite.com slash ring. You sit in a unique spot in having so many organizations of such massive size in, in the nonprofit world. So we talk about this idea of measuring impact, measuring outcomes. Do you see those struggles in the membership of NetHo? Absolutely, and I think this is the critical question, right? Um, this is the critical question that every nonprofit in the world is is dealing with. We, we are, you know, I think collectively very good at, at measuring activity. Um, I think we're even pretty good at, at measuring the quality of the activities. That is not the same, as you well know, and as your as your question alludes to, the same as measuring impact. Um, and sometimes it's it's obvious, you know, if you're if you're doing wildlife protection and you 
you know, d- deploy a new way to, to monitor wildlife and protect against poachers and the endangered species population goes up, you know, good news. That's relatively straightforward. What I think is is harder, though, is, you know, does that endanger, does the increase in that endangered species population also then create new economic opportunities for the, the surrounding communities, right? Or, or does it create new hardships for the surrounding communities? Or does it create something else for the surrounding communities? What is the real impact of, of that delta in, in population? When you start dealing with, you know, the, the impact on individuals and all of the things that, that influence and impact the quality of life for any individual, any family or any community, you know, that gets to be doubly hard to measure and, and really hard to figure out sort of what the impact is. We know if if we do certain interventions, we can improve um, health outcomes for children or elderly or women or whatever the case may be. That's good news, and, and we should keep doing that work. But we also know that if you improve the health of mom, you generally improve the health of the family. But what does that mean, and should, and how would we measure that impact? And you could say mom's health improved, and the and therefore we can assume the the situation for the family improved. You could even measure the situation for the family, but it's also very hard to separate that out from interventions that might have been provided it, with agriculture or with ki- with the kids at school or with improving power in the city and, or the village or whatever the case may be. So it's very hard to sort of parse these things apart. I think the thing that we are all struggling with and that we're all very committed to is, you know, we're not going to figure it out by saying, oh, my gosh, this is really hard. Let's not try anymore. Um, so we got to keep trying. And, you know, and, and really smart people will say yes, but. And so, you know, we do a lot of yes, but what if we did, you know, what if we looked at it this way or what if we measured this instead? And so it is an iterative process. There's not an easy answer, but it, it is the. It is the thing I think we're all chasing. Um, and I think the more that we can use tools to help us understand what the data is actually telling us and whether or not we're collecting the right data and collecting it reliably and collecting good data, but the more that we can do that and the more that we can use tools to, to gain insight from that, the closer we'll get to it. Do you see anybody doing a good job of measuring the impact? It's, uh, no. <laughs> I mean, I would love to say yes. And I think there are certainly, um, I think there are certainly individual programs here and there and individual organizations that are doing a fabulous job with some of the foundational work, you know, to get their data governance in order, to get their data collection in order, to be able to get gain insight, in, you know, for their data across their organization. But they're still faced by the challenges of saying, okay, how do we use data from externally? How do we pull in historical data? And so it is not a problem that we're going to solve in a year or two years or five years, it really is a big cultural shift in the way that, that we in the sector work and the way that, that, that donors set expectations and that, and that donors help us through this process and, and understanding what they want to see and what, what impacts they're hoping to achieve and understanding the difficulties in getting from point A to point B. I was going to ask you, the next question I was going to ask you was, um, if anybody's doing it well, are they seeing an increase in donation as a result of it? But if nobody's really quite there yet it's hard to draw that line yeah it's hard to draw the line and you know i think as challenged as the nonprofits are and 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 global ngos are in working through these issues you know the donor community faces the very same challenges um you know and 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 philanthropic organizations struggle just as much as nonprofits do in many different ways with using technology well you know, I, I recognize the the difficult place that that they themselves are in. Right, everybody wants to know what's the impact. Nobody wants to pay for overhead. It that that actually just doesn't work. As long as we continue to tell organizations that building an infrastructure that will tell you the answers that you want to have is an is overhead, and you have to do that in your overhead bucket from which we also have to pay, you know, fundraising, rent, staff salaries, you know, all these other kinds of things. It's just not going to happen, you know. And so, yeah, I'd like to be five foot ten, you know, blonde and skinny. But if I don't eat my vegetables, work out, dye my hair, those things aren't going to happen, right? If I don't make the investments in making those improvements, um, I'm not quite sure how I'm going to grow four or five inches, but maybe I could learn to walk in heels. But, you know, like, <laughs> you know, if I'm not willing to put in the work and do that, I can't expect those outcomes to be there. But a lot of times that's what we ask of nonprofits. You know, tell us what the impact is going to be. No, we won't pay for for you to, to develop a data governance system. You should do that in the, the extra money you have left over. 
well, in a world of a nonprofit, that is not the way that, that the economics work. And it's, it's one of those things I think we're going to have to resolve, frankly, of everyone that's interested in this space, not just the nonprofits and the donors, but really sort of setting the right expectations and making the right investments if, we're gonna, if we want the insights that, that we say we want to have. And it's, I mean, at the, at the donor level, it's a communication challenge as well. But then, you know, at a broader level, let's say that there were organizations that were getting really good at measuring the impact and they had data and, you know, like you said, not ever going to be perfect, but you can say we contributed to this. Maybe contribution is the right word rather than solve, but communicating why that's important to the general public, even institutional donors that's a whole nother challenge. It's a whole nother challenge. It's a whole nother challenge. And, you know, it, it certainly in the in the technology sector, right, it, it, everyone has been lamenting for years the dearth of expertise. We're not, we do not have enough highly skilled people to do the jobs that are open in the technology sector. That's true in the private sector as well, right? I mean, we, every, every private sector CEO will tell you that they struggle to find talent that not only can do their job, marketing, product development, HR, whatever it is, but also has the technology skills that are necessary to do that job well today and to evolve into the future. We face that same problem in the nonprofit sector. We face that pro- same problem in the philanthropic sector. So we're we're struggling on the on the capacity side. Then we want to explain, you know, why these things are hard and 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 why they need to be different. But, but gosh, we can't do that in technology terms. I mean, it's just, you know, we we all have to recognize what our limitations are. And I think that's one of the things that's been super interesting about NetHope. And one of the reasons that NetHope has been particularly attractive to, to our corporate partners and to nonprofits over the years is the recognition that everybody's got something to contribute. And if we can all sit around the table and kind of be honest with ourselves about what we can bring to the table, then we might be able to make some progress. And it's been great to see that happen. And we just need to do that at greater scale. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't mean to harp on the communication part, but it I, I just, when the hurricane hit the Bahamas, we are the employees at our company were given a choice of some places we could donate to. And I started reading up on them. Uh, I'm not going to name them, but the the descriptions of what they were doing there were so vague and so uninspiring. Um, we have people on the ground. We have people on the ground in Florida. We have people re- at the ready. Like, I don't know what that means, right? And as somebody about to give some money, you know, how do you know? And so then I'm looking, and here's Jose Andres and World Food Kitchen, like ladling food and building these m- right. food that I would pay to eat in a, in a sure. restaurant, right? Sure. And he's, he's there doing it, work. right? Yep. Um, and. And so his communication skill is part of it is what he's doing, obviously, yep. but he's all also a bigger than life presence and has sure. video cameras filming what he does. But but most nonprofits don't necessarily have that genetic makeup yet, <laughs> maybe is a way to say it. Certainly some are better than others. Um, and that also comes out of overhead. Like, sure. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. now, now you're asking me to make a twist. Should I make the should I raise some more money and, and pay for great marketing? Or should I put those dollars to actually doing some work? Or should I do that to building my infrastructure? Or should I pay the rent? Yeah. You know, and it's like, I know that sounds ridiculous, but, you know, we... You shouldn't have to make that choice. We shouldn't have to make that choice. You know, you've seen people talk about this for years about the overhead myth, but we still have, you know, folks that say, don't give to an organization that doesn't spend 90% of its dollars on program. Uh, okay, but what if this year, you know, I need to spend 87% of my dollars on program so I can make an additional investment in my in my data governance infrastructure so that in future years, you know, I, I could, maybe I could get even higher. You know, it, it really limits the ability of organizations to, to make investments where they need to make investments, whether it be in marketing or infrastructure or better people or or faster response. You know, it, it really doesn't matter. I think we, we sometimes hold the nonprofit sector to a set of criteria that frankly don't make a whole lot of sense. I I, the the idea behind them is absolutely correct. We want nonprofits focused on the work that nonprofits do. Picking an arbitrary percentage as a as a percentage of, of revenue and saying, yeah, here's the line, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Again, if we want certain outcomes, if we want to be able to, able to measure impact, if we want organizations to be as, as efficient and effective as possible, if we want them to be able to, to scale things that work, if we want to be able to understand what they're really doing on the ground, those are investments that we collectively as a community are going to have to make. And in the absence of that, being able to to work with our corporate partners, you know, whether it's it's NetSuite or others, it really helps us be able to do that in the most cost efficient way possible. 
And we have a, a sister publication who produced this study on outcomes measurement. And one of the things that we, you know, that we saw was we, we asked about logic models and not to get too much in the weeds of nonprofit finance here, but most people had never heard of a logic model. And most people who even had or even thought about outcomes measurement in general don't have the resources to do it. So, I mean, even more of a catch-22, you know, like, sure, we would love a way to do it. If there was one, we probably couldn't afford to do it anyway. Yep. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, yes. Yes, <laughs> yes, and yes. Um, you know, and, and you know, I, I do think it is one of the things that's remarkable. I mean, the, the technology sector as a whole has been unbelievably generous to the to the nonprofit sector. They really have. I mean, large organizations bring a meaningful amount of resources to support the work that both NetHope, all of our member organizations, and nonprofits well beyond our community. They really have been quite generous. But the fact that there is still this sort of you know gaping maw of need that we are unable to meet. And, and frankly, I don't know is the responsibility of, of our corporate partners to go and, and fill. The, the whole world celebrated, anybody who watches international affairs and cares about this kind of stuff, celebrated when we passed what at the time were called the Sustainable Development Goals, but the Global Goals, right? And everybody's holding up the Global Goals that we, we want to achieve these things by 2030. The delta between what's needed to meet those goals and what we have is $5 trillion. You know, it's, and I, I don't know... Like all the corporate social responsibility programs in the world aren't going to add up to five trillion dollars. All the USAID, DFID, CETAs, and and private philanthropic organizations, which now outpace institutional ones, are not going to to, to do five trillion dollars. And look, you know, I, my background's in economics. This is a real simple problem, right? You have inputs and outputs, and the only way to increase outputs with the same number of inputs is increase productivity. And the only way you're going to do that is these days through technology. So if you're not going to make those kinds of investments and you're not going to, to, to study and learn and understand how to replicate those types of, of gains in productivity, all these problems that, that you've identified, whether you know what a logic model is or not, are never going to be attainable. They're not going to be affordable. And we're going to be sitting here 20 years from now having the same problem, you know, having the same conversation about the needs and the, and, and the resources, you know, are just not lined up. So... Look, it's not the only problem in the nonprofit sector. I'm sure that every sector feels like demand outstrips resources available to meet that demand. I do think that it's commendable, and I'm have been thrilled to be part of folks sitting around a table trying to figure out how do we make the best of what we have. But let's not lose sight of the fact that yeah, there's there's places where we could backfill this, and we could probably do more. But if this is what we have, and this is what we're able to marshal together then we're willing to set aside our competitive pressures, our interorganizational challenges, or whatever the case may be, to figure out how we do how we do good better. That's a great note, and I, I would like to end on it, but I feel like I've missed one thing, which is the Center for Digital Nonprofit. We started the Center for the Digital Nonprofit a couple of years ago, just recognizing that this question of digital transformation that everybody's struggling with in the private sector, we're struggling with in the nonprofit sector, too. And the challenges are the same. You know, the how do you drive organizational change? What are the right investments to make? How do you reimagine the way that we deliver aid? You know, how do we make sure that as we make incremental changes to our infrastructure, they are laddering up to a transformative process that will allow us greater impact at greater scale and greater reach? You know, if the private sector struggles with that, and of course they do, nonprofits struggle with it as well. And our, our models, we can learn a lot from what the private sector has done. Our models are slightly different. The way we do business is slightly different. So we created a place where we could really focus on the the transformative opportunities that that technology creates for the sector and to to turn a very focused eye to learn what's working and what's not working so that you know we can make a mistake once but we don't have to make that mistake again. Um, and, and we can we can share what works so that we can accelerate the opportunity for all nonprofits based on the collective experience of, of those of us that are, are working in this space. Great. Well, thank you. You guys are doing great work and uh, look forward to hearing more progress. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Nonprofits have such gigantic hurdles, and it's great to hear about the work NetHope is doing to help on so many fronts. And Lauren is such an impressive leader. Honestly, she was... Uh, she blew my mind. She is so cool. And like, uh, just, yeah, for sure inspirational. Yeah. And we, after we uh, turned off the mics, we talked about 
places in the world to live, and uh, it was fascinating. Yes, definitely. Thank you so much to Ned Hope's Lauren Woodman for joining us on this episode of the Grow Wire podcast. I also want to thank our sponsors at Hint, Blue Mics, and Ring, our editors over at Lampstand, as well as you, Kendall, our producer. I wonder if listeners know that I occasionally write these, and so sometimes I'm just thanking myself. That's weird. Yeah, that is weird. (laughs) Oh, God, there's the cough. There it is. Get the echinacea hint. Going in, going in. Thank you all for tuning in. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. See you next time. You just listened to the Grow Wire podcast with host Fritz Nelson. Make sure to keep tuning in for more episodes full of tips, tools, stories, and strategies to help take your personal and professional growth to the next level. Until next time.